Thank you so much to everybody for coming today. This is going to be a brief presentation on my PhD research. My name is Claire El Kowatli. I was born in Vancouver, Canada. I became a Muslim in 2001, and I became interested in how children learn Islam, as I myself learned Islam as an adult, not a child. So I was really interested in how uh, we would teach children Islam. And so I went in to do a master's and a PhD in human development. And my PhD research involved um, examining ways of teaching Islam pedagogies or methods of teaching. So now I'm going to share my screen so that we can start a presentation that I would like to share with you. So the title of my presentation is Methods of Teaching Islam, Learning from Canadian Muslim Educators. As we go through the presentation, I would just like you to keep in mind what is your purpose um, as Muslim educators for teaching Islam with young people? It's so important as we think about methods to think about what we're aiming to do with young people. So this was the agenda, um, a 40 minute presentation is gonna be shorter than that. So a tiny bit of background is we always have to identify where we are located. My study took place in um, a Canadian city and all of the names of the places and people are pseudonyms. They're not real names to protect the identity of the participants. So uh, Muslim communities in general are growing in secular Western societies whereby a secular culture is dominant and yet education in Islam is important to many, many people. And how we teach is as important as what we teach, but primarily to date, most research has been on content and curriculum. Um, research into methods of teaching Islam, Islamic pedagogies is a growing field of research. So the, I'm gonna be inquiring into the methods we use or the pedagogies. And I'm wondering, are there any unique to an Islamic worldview? And what, what is, what would be an Islamic pedagogy? So why are pedagogies important in the first place? First of all, they foster human development. They can draw it forward or they can stunt it. What we do with children matters to their human development and that's holistic development. So we're talking about spiritual, cognitive, intellectual, social and emotional and physical. But pedagogies are also important because we want young people to retain what we teach them so that they can apply it and they can actually live it. So content retention is important for application and also identity development. Uh, the methods that we use with young people will contribute to their identity in positive or negative ways. So I asked 35 Muslim Canadian educators a key question. This was a simple exploratory study with a, with a straightforward question. How do you teach Islam to children and youth? Now, in terms of my research participants, where did they teach? They taught at formal Islamic primary schools, at mosque or weekend schools, and I also had five freelance Muslim educators who taught in the community as needed. And I had four school leaders and the rest were educators. And I use the word educator to um, honor the fact that Islamic education takes place in many different venues. It doesn't only take place in schools, it takes place wherever people are getting together, older and young generations um, to engage in activities together. And it happens over the lifespan. So I conducted interviews and focus groups um, that generated 20 hours of talk, audio recorded, which I then turned into transcriptions, text, and I read them and analyzed them. And the participants uh, referred to 17 back home cultures in making sense of how they teach Islam in Canada, which I thought was really interesting. Um, these home cultures, they either took good ideas from these home cultures or they wanted to teach differently from these home cultures, but they, they really did turn up in our discussions. So what did the educators say? They said lots, and I don't want you to read every single little bit here, but what I want to show you is my process of how I discerned three themes. 
So of the 20 hours of talk that was turned into text, I read it very, very closely. And I started to uh, discern big ideas. And so I would write them down. And then I found out that they, you know, some they would cluster into different thematic areas. So there were some that really involved context, others that were straight up methodologies, others that spoke about the learner or the educator, others that uh, spoke really about what Islamic education is. So from all of this, these little codes, I came up with three particular themes. The first one um, clustered around the idea that there are unique perspectives to human beings from an Islamic perspective. The second one is that culture and context changes pedagogy. It changes the way we teach Islam based on where we are. And the third theme is that transcendent pedagogies link a person to Allah. So basically there are very interesting pedagogies that the educators described that were far beyond a Western kind of understanding of, of education and pedagogy. So now I'm gonna go through each one on their own. So the first theme, I call them dimensional pedagogies because they engage the human being and the unique conceptions of the human being. So one of the research participants called Bilal said, what is the insan? So when you say that I am an insan or I am from the Bashar or the Bani Adam, all of these things have actual meanings to them. So what I'm gonna do is provide little quotes and bits of data. These are, these are, these are data bits essentially to um, justify why I clustered uh, the information into these three themes. The words of the educators are really primary in this presentation. So what we call ourselves um, have implications. And Abid, another educator, described how the Quran speaks about the ruh, the soul, the nafs, the lower self, the kalb, and the akal, intelligence. So within the Quran, we have these distinct domains of, of the human being. And Amal said, the soul needs food as the body needs food. Islamic practice or Quran or prayer, this is food for our spirit. So all of these educators are indicating that there really are unique dimensions to the human that require particular pedagogies to be to engage them. And uh, a really key quote here is, uh, Abid said, when you understand something, you're in a better position to deal with it. This is like a, a, a wake up call in a way for for us as Muslim educators to think about, do we understand the dimensions of the children that we're educating and their various different human dimensions? Um, if we understand somebody to have a nafs, what are we gonna do with that knowledge? Or if they have a fitra, what are we gonna do with that? So some examples of dimensional pedagogies are um, honoring learner dignity. So this is part of their fitra. By fitra, a human being has dignity and honor, don't break that. An example of this um, was described to me by an educator called Gina, where she talked about in having children recite Quran, the non-native Arabic speakers oftentimes have pronounce the words. And so rather than having them repeat it over and over and become embarrassed in front of their peers, she would often allow them to move on. And then she would, one-on-one, um, uh, -on -one, she would work on them on the station. So that's a way of honoring their dignity, speaking directly to their fitra. Child leadership was another one. I walked into one of the weekend mosque schools during uh, the her prayer time, and there was a child calling the adhan, and it, it, it reminded um, me of the fact that uh, enabling children to lead is incredibly educative because in the process of leading, they're, they're deeply learning and they're internalizing. So having children lead aspects of really important um, acts of worship are, is an amazing pedagogy. Uh, acknowledging learner intelligence was a really interesting one. Um, one of the educators gave the example of Ibn Abbas, who was a child at the time of the Prophet and one could consider him a child Sahaba, really. And his knowledge, this child, transcended many of the adults of his time. And this is directly connected to an Islamic perspective of knowledge, whereby we believe that it has a divine source. If knowledge, all knowledge comes from Allah, and therefore a child may be able to gain more knowledge than an adult would. Um, so a third dimensional pedagogy would be uh, techniques of self-refinement, in particular, uh, disciplining the nafs. So 
self-refinement is sort of um, one of these practices that we do as adults and we teach them to children and it's a lifelong pursuit we're constantly self-refining and in a way one could argue that many of the islamic practices are are intended for that towards a larger objective of taqwa or god consciousness uh, so in that process disciplining the nafs is is really important especially in an age where so many of the things in our world have been actually designed intentionally to hook the lower self um, psychology is studied in order to find out the best ways to, to hook us in. So helping children understand when is their nafs crying out for something and differentiating that from a real need is, is an important aspect of our teaching. And then a final dimensional pedagogy, thinking about who are these people who are learning and developing, is that educators and children together um, are developing themselves in processes of Islamic education. And oftentimes in the process of teaching it, we ourselves are developing along with the students. And this was something that came up again and again with the educators. And it's captured in this quote, the mosque school is a great opportunity to, opportunity to improve all of us hand in hand, mashallah, to excellence. And this is a really interesting quote because it, it reminds us that this is a collective in, developmental endeavor. And the goal is excellence, which um, is a unique concept of Ihsan, which is itself like amongst the more exalted levels of awareness within the deen and is connected also to taqwa and consciousness of God. So, um, okay, so the second theme are contextual pedagogies. And these themes all revolved around the fact that culture changes Islamic pedagogy. And some exemplary bits of data are Hannah saying, the way how I learned Islam is not like how I am teaching Islam now. And Fatima said, you need to plant seeds that match the weather. Can you take mango seeds and plant them in Alaska? This is what we do with our children. I cannot teach them the same way that my mom or dad taught me. You know, people criticize education for being outdated or stuck in, you know, in old traditions. And I think these pedagogies really made it clear that we take timeless principles and we um, engage children in them in ways that are relevant to the here and now. So Ferris said, freedom is absolutely essential and it's in the air. It's the zeitgeist of our time. So characterizing Islamic education for these kids living in Canada is that freedom is in the air. And, and this has some implications, which we're going to look at now. Examples of contextual pedagogies are questioning and inquiry. Ferris said that we're gonna question absolutely everything. And this may not be a pedagogical approach that one would um, necessarily think is, is traditional to Islamic education and yet there are, there are examples over time that we, we really should be questioning everything all the way back to, uh, to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Uh, play is another one where Fatima said, I'm in Canada. She was describing a, a preschooler telling her teacher, I'm in Canada, I want to play, I want to draw, I want to listen to music, I want to have fun. And so the, the point is how can we teach Islam through fun and play? And then a third example are what I called context response pedagogies, which are directly in relationship to facing discrimination and challenge in society. And so educators describe teaching their children public speaking in order that they can express themselves and speak up. And some educators described how we can draw from the message of the Prophet to respond to with beauty to, to these kinds of rude um, challenges. And she was describing here uh, a situation of Islamophobia in society where she said, I smile. And she reminds herself, you're an ambassador for Islam. And another context response pedagogy was barreling towards contention. So um, several of the educators described actually heading straight for the most contentious issues. And Bilal gave an example of working with the children on questions like, does God really exist or not? And the purpose of this was not just to sort of be um, alarmist or uh, controversial in class. It was actually to, in a supportive environment, help young learners really 
um, come face to face with some of the most difficult questions that they're going to face out in the real world. Uh, Sadine described helping her female students understand what is my relationship with boys, because, you know, approaches to gender relations differ in the different contexts. And Ferris described working with his students on how to have a complicated relationship with the text, whereby if, if you come across things in the Quran or in the Sirah or in the Hadith that, that don't seem to, to fit with your particular understanding of the world, how can you be okay with, with complexity? How can you have a complicated relationship with the text? So all of these were, were, response, were responses in a way to the context they were living in. Some examples are that, um, well, actually, Canadian cultural relevance is a, is a big sub-theme of the contextual pedagogies. Uh, and it's defined by literacy beyond English. So it's, a, you know, it's good to be able to speak English, but in order to teach is relevant to the Canadian cultural context, Literacy is required in other areas. So one is in social issues, whereby Sadine described understanding the culture, what peer pressure means, what suicidal thoughts mean, and what resources are out there. So for, for, for Muslim educators to really be on the pulse of what's happening out in the society. And uh, it also means literacy and research. So Maria um, pointed out that in the Canadian system, kids research, challenge, and motivate themselves. For high schoolers, they don't want to go to university without these skills. We need to put that idea of research in Islamic education. So it mirroring what was happening in Canadian schools and societies is teaching Islam in harmony with those things. And also literacy in reason. Fatima described, if somebody in society asks a question about Islam, we need to be able to answer back in reason. It's really, um, it's almost, you know, sometimes when you move context, it is like speaking, learning how to speak a different language. And maybe we use different words, we highlight different concepts. Um, and uh, Hamza undergirded, um, even our identity as Muslims is understanding why we are Muslims and being able to articulate that. So helping kids develop Islamic um, understandings in ways that, that uh, the center reason along with faith. So the third theme were transformative pedagogies uh, that I call transcendent pedagogies. And they're, they are very unique and specific to the Dean. They aim to awaken taqwa as consciousness of Allah as a primary aim. They culminate in an ultimate human development because um, they require transformation of all of our different domains. They included reasoning, reflecting often on nature and direct teaching, which are all sort of cognitive approaches. But they also included uh, spiritual um, pedagogies. And one of them is a quote from Amira, who said that, well, actually, many of the teachers described starting class with the Doha of Musa. And she elaborated that by doing a doa, open up my heart to your light and the hearts of all of these listeners. And she described how they don't do that in the secular and she referred to it as our secret. So doa is like a secret tool that Muslim educators have in working with young children. And then Ferris pointed out that pedagogies, even transcendent pedagogies can have two particular dimensions. So one is mediated, whereby a teacher, things a teacher uses to help children relate to Allah, Quran, Hadith, Sirah, and their own selves. So these are, um, we use these things to help a child mediate relationship with God. And then there are unmediated pedagogies. So um, these are pedagogies that help a young person to uh, foster a direct connection with Allah. And he said, if you were to bank on a mediated relationship all the way, then it might fall apart at some point. If you were to think that your relationship with the prophet is a rock solid foundation that will not fail you, maybe you're mistaken. If you think that your relationship with the Quran is that foundation that will last you forever, the moment it shakes, you lose your connection with God. So the importance is realizing that these are just means and that the end is a relationship with God. 
it actually gives me shivers to think of educators working on this with young people, how deep it is and how profound and transformative it can be. So some examples of these are supplication dua, which we already described, um, teaching learners how to do it for themselves and also educators doing it for learners. Uh, so, um, Uh, Fatima pointed out that du'a can change fate. You know, another critique that many non-Muslims have of Islamic education is that it's it has this kind of indoctrination aspect and that there's no learner autonomy. And this just absolutely contradicts that because what you're basically understanding is that when you have this close relationship with Allah and you, you do du'a, you talk with Allah, that you can actually sort of change the course of, of, of fate. And that's some kind of ultimate spiritual superpower. I want us to, you know, so much of this stuff is already in the deen. Everybody knows about dua. If we can think about it as what are its really transformative effects, then I think it will be even more powerful. Another transcendent pedagogy was triangulated reflection. And this was Noor talking about young people. Sometimes they do reflection on themselves from Islamic teachings. They can understand themselves more and make it real in their lives. So what she's referring to the fact that when we do reflection, sometimes we just simply reflect, but other times we actually triangulate our reflection with either Islamic teachings or even what Allah might be thinking of us. And the ability to do this is really a metacognitive ability. Um, but it allows us to sort of look at ourselves um, uh, in a way the most critical light and in a way the, the best light. If you try to look at yourself in terms of what Allah thinks of you, obviously we're never going to be able to en encompass that. But the, the, the practice of doing that really makes us understand certain things about ourselves that we might not have seen otherwise. Another um, transcendent pedagogy are secret acts of worship, which was were described by Hamza that he teaches the kids. He teaches them, you should be having something that you do in private for the sake of Allah in a way that no one knows about. And he gave examples of, you know, doing prayers at night when nobody's awake or giving charity that nobody knows about. This is amazing to teach our children to, uh, to actually do these things for now. And it is an un, that is an unmed, unmediated pedagogy. So the final thing is the educator's own consciousness the fact that we ourselves are working to expand our awareness of God. And if we can do that, we can be ever more effective with the children that we're educating. So our own development and our own um, consciousness is really important. Our own faith, depths of faith and levels of faith and development. And we, we know this, that the Prophet Sallallahu just being in his presence would transform the people around him. And um, his sahabas wanted to always be in that state, and yet they found when they would leave him that they wouldn't be in as high a state as they were when they were with him. So this really sort of gives us something to aim for in a way um, that we should be developing ourselves. So now I'm going to show you a diagram that summary, summarizes these uh, three themes, and it was constructed from the words of all of the participants. So um, you'll see, you'll, you may see quotes from different people within it. So you start with the child, with the child's unique human dimensions. That child has a direct connection to Allah. And one of our goals is to make that visible with the child and to help the child nurture it on their own. The child has a parent and an educator, uh, which forms a kind of triangle. So remember, we spoke about the mediated pedagogies. So at, you know, the child would be working through the educator or the parent towards Allah. And when I say educator and parent, I mean other people as well, aunts, uncles. That um, And the Quran is part of that process with which a child interacts with Allah directly or mediated. That child lives within a cultural context and within an environment that includes friends, Islamic schools, and mosques. Um, but there is uh, there's a line of transcendence, which means that where a secular child in a secular context, it might stop there. They have the they have their cultural context, their environment, their parent, their educator, but they don't have these things that go on beyond um, a line, the line of the visible. So things that we can't tangibly touch or see, 
And a lot of our work as educators happens in this space beyond the realm of the tangible, so the ghaib. And what we're trying to do is, is to awaken that consciousness of God. And that, that's where we, can, we want to foster this unmediated relationship between a child and Allah. So transcendent pedagogies really function on that line of transcendence where you're, you're working with kids in the area of the unseen. And then we have the human dimensional pedagogies where you're really working with a child on their dimensions, the, their particular dimensions. And the third is you have the um, pedagogies that actually engage the cultural context and make use of them to all to help the child develop um, this relationship with Allah. And another uh, diagram that summarized the three themes all together uh, is Ruby's flower. Now, uh, I asked all of the educators to draw an artifact, to do draw a diagram or a drawing of how they see methods of teaching Islam. How do they see pedagogies? And what Ruby's flower indicated is that they are holistic and they really, they overlap and they, 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 they can't really be separated out of a larger system of education. So she said, it's not only how the teacher is teaching, it's about the environment, all these things around the student, the teacher's personality, the child himself, because these are all affecting the teaching methods. This is why it's not only about the teaching methods. So this was a really um, helpful diagram for me as the researcher to look at, because here I am asking her only for methods and she draws a whole system and she really illustrated how they're, they all interact and they're all needed all together. So from this research, I, I came up with kind of a tentative definition. Um, culturally relevant to dominant and minority cultures, Islamic pedagogies link unique dimensions of learners to unique objectives of Islamic education. So all of the three, three themes are contained within this, um, this definition, um, acknowledging that we do have very unique objectives we're trying to um, engage the learner in. And what, what does all of this mean for us as educators, as parents? So after doing thematic analysis on, on the, the interview transcripts with the participants, um, discerning implications and what this means is like a second level of analysis. So what it means for teachers is that we need to engage all dimensions of learners. And maybe we're already doing that. And if we're not, we should go back and have a look at what those dimensions are and what are the best ways to engage them. Um, educating Muslim human beings requires Islamic pedagogies. Uh, we also need to study the local culture to find out what, what, what is going on there that we can work with and what is going on there that we should help children learn to resist. Uh, and Islamic pedagogies are catalysts of character and consciousness. And it all calls into question conventional teacher education programs. You, they're useful, uh, you know, it's really important that we continue our higher training, whether it's teacher education programs or masters, PhDs, whatever we decide to do to um, continue learning. But we need to understand that we also have to develop our own programs because conventional ones they don't contain all that we need. And so I think it's really important to take the best of all of them and to, to, to search for the hikmah and to see the, the, non -is, the Islamic and the non-Islamic and really work to develop our own institutions further. A meta implication of this study um, was a quote from a participant called Gina. She said, if young Muslims, if they build up, build up a Muslim identity, they know about their deen, they know about their mu'amalat, and how to behave with others, either Muslims or non-Muslims, and how to be Muslim Canadian citizens, they can contribute to the development of Canada. So imagine this educator is, she has the highest goal in mind for her students in terms of social contribution. But in order to contribute to the development of the country, they need to be strong in their Islamic identity. I thought this was just really an important um, point that we should always keep in mind. Um, and this requires all of the pedagogies that we've been talking about. So a key role 
of ours as Muslim educators is to help young Muslims think across contexts. We all live in multiple worlds and those multiple worlds have very different frames of reference and worldviews. And critically important is helping young Muslims be able to think across them. Some educators, most of them really described how important this was. And some of them even said that if they felt um, unequipped to do it, they would outsource that kind of thinking to uh, their grown children who had grown up in Canada. So one of the educators actually had her grown children come and talk to the young Muslims about how to navigate high school. And she had them do that because she herself hadn't gone to high school in Canada. So this kind of outsourcing is, is an excellent idea, but it, it is really important to help young Muslims think across contexts and not have to lose one with the other to be able to integrate across paradigms, which are the at the deepest levels of our thought and concepts for self and social development both. So thank you so much. That's the end of my presentation. Um, I really hope it was useful and meaningful and that we can continue a dialogue from here. Jazakumala khair and may Allah forgive me for my mistakes. Thank you so much and salam alaikum.